Good afternoon. Pleasure to be here presenting and grateful for the opportunity. I'm Matthew Gangadine, a fourth year medical student out of UTIS and going to be talking about the uh, asset course and some of the links we found into people's opinions on it relating to, to deployment and pre-deployment training. Let's see. All right, so I have no uh, conflicts or anything related to this. Um, so the background, I mean, just a lot of words up here, but things we're all aware, aware of, a lot of it kind of the, that came up in the, the Admiral's talk earlier too, but, but in general, um, we've become very successful at managing trauma in a lot of cases non-operatively, combining this with such elements as, you know, resident duty hour restrictions over the past uh, years and decreasing um, even some, some reports of decreasing instances of, of penetrating trauma in motor vehicle accidents nationwide. People are just kind of getting less exposure to these types of things in a regular basis of their training. Um, it may, those surgeons who are more experienced and have many years under their belt may have had a, a built up experience about this, but it's uh, kind of particularly relevant for those who may have kind of missed the boat on some of that training initially and can benefit from courses such as this to, to catch up, so to speak. Um, in the military, there are additional challenges as well, of course, where a lot of times the environments we find ourselves in stateside don't kind of correlate exactly with what we end up treating downrange. So the asset course, the Advanced Surgical Skills for Exposure and Trauma, is one potential kind of course to, to fill this gap in some ways. Developed through uh, the Committee on Trauma, it's a cadaver-based course, it's just a single day, and basically is focused on giving uh, people hands-on opportunities to kind of go through some uh, vascular exposures they otherwise might not get to do on a regular basis. Um, the course kind of debuted in 2010, and, and since then kind of has really taken off, training over uh, 3,500 people over the past uh, years since then in uh, numerous places across the country, including each civilian as well as military applications for this. So uh, for our work, we sent out a detailed anonymous online survey sent to military surgeons kind of in the initial cohort of people who were taking this class in uh, 2010 to 2013. So at that time, military surgeons made up 43%, uh, a pretty good number of those taking it. And that was about 249 people. A lot of emails and whatnot have changed uh, since then. We were able to reach about 228 of those people. So we kind of uh, focused on questions across a number of content areas to see people's kind of insights on relations of this course and their kind of deployment uh, preparation potentially. So there's a lot of kind of information and data that came out of it, but just kind of going to try to pull out a couple um, interesting insights potentially. So at this time, we've had uh, 80 people respond for a response rate of 35%. Just want to make the point, well, that's, that's pretty typical for uh, an online survey. So that's uh, the sample is representative of that population. But just that that population, this is only you know, people who happen to take this one particular course during this particular time. So it is possible that there is some, uh, some biases in there and whatnot, but at least of those uh, surg military surgeons who underwent this course, these are kind of their opinions. Um, it's pretty well spread out though over rank, service, uh, those who are retired and separated at this time would have been um, active duty or guard or reserve when they took it. Mostly general surgeons, 80%, some uh, orthopods as well. Most people were uh, true general surgeons without fellowship training, but after that, uh, trauma would be the next kind of most prevalent subspecialty within surgery. So results of this, so those who were uh, still at the time this survey was administered, kind of years after they initially took the course, who were still active duty in either Guard or Reserve were uh, 59 people. Only 32% of them, so about a third, indicated that trauma is part of their kind of day-to-day -day practice um, for where they're currently stationed. For those who were working mostly out of civilian hospitals, this was 42%, and those working mostly out of military hospitals, this is about a quarter. So again, of those who were just active duty, um, purely, 15% of them worked at civilian hospitals uh, primarily, and then with the vast majority, 85% working at military hospitals. Although of those, almost um, half or slightly over half did spend some time working at civilian hospitals too in uh, you know, the interest of supplementing their skills and whatnot, but only people reported only spending about 8% of their time on average there. So it's um, fairly, fairly sparse in that regard. So about 30% of these are level one trauma centers reporting an incidence of about 15% penetrating trauma that they routinely see. And again, 15% of people who indicate that they get any sort of regular exposure to, to vascular trauma and these vascular exposures that can uh, become particularly relevant downrange for hemorrhage control. So we uh, had people rate not only the asset course, but many other kind of similar 
potentially pre-deployment type of courses that they went through, kind of X amount of the interest. We're not trying to necessarily rank and stack other courses, but just those that were, were grouped at the top there. This is, again, just on a five-point Likert scale in terms of how well they felt that these particular courses prepared them in particular for deployment. So again, this wasn't one asset survey, potentially some bias there, but asset was, was ranked well, and the Adam course and then the emergency war surgery course that had asset uh, co-administered for it were, were ranked pretty well. And really, all these courses, you know, were, were fairly well received overall, as you can see there. So in, in particular, people taking this asset course and just kind of rating their general overall confidence in being able to, to handle kind of whatever they might find in terms of uh, combat casualties, from being not confident at all to extremely confident. Um, people certainly, you know, aren't coming in at a total loss, but kind of somewhere in the middle of the road at, at about a 3.3 there, as you can see. And then after taking this course, basically kind of get a, you know, on this five-point scale, an equivalent of a one-point bump in their, in their confidence, so at a level that's statistically significant, significant. So people certainly seeing some benefit from this in their experience relating to deployment uh, thereafter. Again, there are a number of injury patterns that are gone over in the asset course. This just highlights uh, some of the main or most pertinent ones. And you can see there's a, a range from about three to four. So again, from one being asset making no difference at all in terms of their management of these diseases, and five being a market improvement in their comfort and efficacy. So you kind of see a moderate bump in their uh, kind of ability to handle these types of injuries or at least be confident that they could if they come up. And again, kind of potentially a synergistic effect kind of seen at the, at the bottom there with their kind of overall confidence just in caring for combat casualties in general, exceeding kind of the uh, kind of individual exposures. Some other interesting kind of thoughts on just how often people should be doing this that respondents kind of came back with. So the, the vast majority there, you can see about 85% believe that this should be done at some sort of regular interval, whether that's dictated by a person's deployment schedule and you go along with every deployment, or if you kind of just do it on a regular basis independent of that. Most people were in that camp that something like this should be done. Additionally, for those who did answer on a regular basis, most fell in the camp of about every two to three years seeming to be a good amount. Additionally, in terms of who to train, we queried for military residents in particular that 4.7 number, again on this five point scale, most people felt very strongly that it would be beneficial for military surgery residents in particular to attend a course or something like the asset course or a similar course like it before they graduate. Some, uh, a poster at AAST last summer by Dr. Gurney showed that, uh, of active duty army surgeons, showed that over half of them are deploying within their first year out of residency, and uh, three-fifths of those people have not had any sort of pre-deployment training at all. So it's kind of a trial by fire at that point for those people. So those are numbers that are bolded there, again, kind of particularly relevant, that 4.6 to 4.4 at the bottom in terms of just some type of training versus none at all. Um, it doesn't have to be asset, but people think something would be beneficial. So again, this unique challenge that we have in terms of kind of bridging the gap between what can be seen at home and what can be seen in the deployed environment is something that, you know, people are very interested in continuing to find ways to, to approach and ask that's one particular uh, potential solution to that. Thank you. Happy to take any questions.